feasibility study is a pride in micro hydro power systems is basically an assessment in terms of the potential power that could be generated from some water source. Uh, it also includes an analysis of the demand that is basically the potential energy users to evaluate the amount of energy that they potentially would want to use. And in addition, we are also trying to look at the ideal or the optimal solution for the establishment of a micro hydro power station. In a pre feasibility studies, you have got um, a number of stages uh, which starts basically with the technical uh, appraisal. The technical appraisal is basically looking at evaluating the potential drop in water, which is the head, and also the flow of the water in the river or in the stream. So those two parameters basically would give you what we can term the hydro potential of the river source. The next stage is basically the estimation of the demand that is where the power will be used. What is the level of the power required to provide to the people who will be using the energy? So given these two basic components where you know the demand and also you know the potential available water, the, 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 the potential energy available from the flowing water, you are then able to evaluate whether that river is good enough or you might need to adjust the demand so that these two parameters are equal. The ideal situation is whereby you have the power available from the water being greater or equal to the demand that the consumers would want. The amount of water in the river. So for us to get power, and uh, to get power, we need the flow, the amount, the water in the river, and also the head, which is the elevation. So we measure the flow first to, to see if there was enough water. Then we also measure the cross section of the river to determine the size of the weir, so that when we do our designs, we are, we are cognizant of the width of the weir, which will then and the amount of water, which will then give us the height of the weir, which we can use to determine the power. When we measure the flow, the speed of the water, we measure the maximum, the minimum, and also we measure it at three different points, at the, surf at the base, at the surface, and at 60% of the depth. This is to make sure that we get the average flow in the river, the average speed, because speed varies with layer. Then we then use integration to find the, the discharge of the stream. Basically, that, th those are the steps that we do to measure the diversion, to calculate the diversion and come up with the diversion of the water, because we want to take the water from the river outside into a canal. After that, we we'll go to the proposed uh, four bay tank uh, position. Then we determine the contour where we are going to put our canal. Then also the coordinates of that point. We we'll then measure uh, the the penstock length from the 4 bay, proposed 4 bay site to the proposed power site. And we also measure the elevation difference so that we can get the edge and calculate the power. Um, in also this assessment, we want to be able to see whether there are other users who are also accessing the same water source. Uh, you need to take that into consideration as you come up with your final <laughs> flow that determines the hydro potential. Because the river might be flowing at 100 liters per second, but also you need to take into consideration other users. There might be other irrigation streams who are also abstracting water from the same point that you want to abstract. So those you need to take into consideration in coming up with the final figure for your flow. Over and above that, you need to also to understand basically the flooding of the river. To what extent uh, and when it floods, where does the river get up to? This is very critical in the flood level for the river in also getting a, a greater appreciation of the type and size of structure that we establish across the river. 
So flooding is also a critical component. Information, if you can't get it, it's something which you can also interrogate the local communities and they can be able to give you a better explanation with regards to um, what the flooding levels of the rivers are. It can be a 10-year flood, a 100-year flood. That's very critical information in the civil design of the, of the structures. As for the environmental impact assessments, that's something which is also important. It's a stage which is important. You want to be able to see to what extent will the infrastructure which you intend to establish disturb the environment. Do you have serious environmental consequences which will arise out of whatever activities that you're going to carry out in establishing that structure? And also for future, what sort of future impacts do you anticipate that structure to have, both on the flora and also the fauna? So that it's important to be able at this stage to understand what sort of flora and fauna do exist within the uh, river and within the area. So that later on when your system is established, you should be able to, to, to really understand to what extent that system is going to impact on those, on those uh, flora and fauna. And also what sort of mitigation actions can you put in place if there is any impact that you anticipate which is critical. There are also a number of key elements that we need to consider. These include the geology of the area. The geology of the area basically entails also understanding the nature of the soils, understanding the water quality, uh, understanding the rock type, the underlying rock which is in that area. This is basically to help you in establishing the structures that will help us to divert the, the water. If it is in the run of the river system, you, have, you want to be able to then move the water out of the stream and drop it at a certain stage and then take it back into the river. Uh, the purpose of geology within the pre-feasibility studies is mainly to look at the rock types or the lithology. We're also going to look at the water, the water depth, that is the hydrogeology part. And also we need to look at the water quality because it is of great concern to the machinery and to the people who are going to use it. Also, it should be noted that the purpose of geology is not only limited to these three things, but we also need to look at the soil types to, lay, to determine the stability or if they are of any economic significance. For example, can they be used for irrigation or for farming purposes? And also, we need to look at the slope stability. This is of great concern because when the slopes are unstable, it means that the river will have a high sediment load and this is not very good and it will reduce the efficiency. Basically, that is the scope of geology within the pre-feasibility studies. But it can be more detailed depending on the requirements and on the scale of the work. Since we are dealing with energy systems that we intend to support uh, energy service for marginalized communities in the remote parts of the, of the country, it's also important to be able to understand the socio-economic profile of that community. And this exercise is critical in order to be able to determine not only the demand, but also you want to be able to assess at what level is energy, a, 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 what is the energy what is the budget contribution of energy as they currently use it to the overall household income? That's very important in order for us to be able to assess the extent to which these communities are going to pay for the service or are going to be able to afford the service. So you want at the end of the day to be able to package the energy service delivered for these communities such that it's affordable and it's also um, people who then be willing to pay for it. The socio-economic survey is one of the most important areas in the pre-feasibility studies. Why do we do the socio-economic survey? The socio-economic survey 
he helps us to ascertain the current livelihoods, also want to ascertain the economic status of the particular area. We also want to ascertain ability and willingness to pay for electricity. When you're carrying out a uh, socio-economic survey, there are particular areas you look at. For example, you have to look at the household level, you also have to look at the institutional level. And under the institutional level, there are various sectors, the health sector, the education sector, as well as the business sector. Under the household survey, you basically look at the following issues. First, the demographic issues of a particular household. Also look at the current energy use within that household. You also look at the energy expenditure within that household. You also look at uh, the livelihoods of that particular household. And lastly, you also look at uh, the willingness and the ability to pay for electricity. Under the health sector, you also look at the current use, the current constraints that are being faced by that particular health sector because of lack of electricity. You also look at the number of, uh, number of people who are serviced by that clinic. You also look at the catchment area. Under the school, you look at uh, also the current use, the current source, what are they using to deliver their curriculum. You also look at the number of students and you disaggregate the number of students, male and female. Also look at the number of teachers, male and female. You also look at uh, some of the things that can be improved within the curriculum if electricity was going to be there. This information you get it from the students, you can also get it from the teachers. Under the business sector, you look at the current use also. You look at the uh, operation hours. You look also at the value of the business. You look at the services the business is providing to the customers. And you also need to probe uh, what electricity will improve in terms, of, uh, in terms of profit and operation of the business. There are various tools that can be used to conduct, conduct this socio-economic survey. For the household uh, survey, basically uh, we use questionnaires and in some cases, focus group discussions, especially when you are targeting a particular group, like a group of women or a group of children. But mostly it's questionnaires for the household. And for the business, you can also use uh, questionnaires and open-ended questionnaires. Under the, health, under the health sector, it's usually a one-on-one -on -one interview with the responsible member of the health center. And under the school, we usually do the interviews with the teachers, the school director, or the students. After compiling all this data, the data is analyzed and the results are shared with the technical team. The technical team basically concentrates on the supply side. And the social economic survey basically concentrates on the demand side. These components are all critical in the end for the overall sustainability of the system. So basically a pre-feasibility study is really a study where ultimately you want to be able to answer yes or no that you are able to generate power from a potential energy source. And if the answer is no, then your decision is to terminate the study before you invest quite a lot of money into it. Alternatively, if your decision is yes, then you want to be able to then go ahead and say, okay, given that there's potential and there's potential demand, there's potential from the river, how then do we start to look at options in terms of optimizing the construction costs, the, the overall investment that you want to put into it? That's where we then go into detailed engineering designs, which we look at the various now options, which is now the next stage following the detail designs. So, uh, in a basic, that's basically the, the, the idea and the objective of a pre-feasibility study in the micro-hydro power system development.